everyone. My name is Maria Thomas, and I work for Allianz Research, the global team of economists, strategists, sector advisors, and foresight experts of the Allianz Group, led by Ludovic Subron. Welcome to Tomorrow, a podcast where we'll be talking about our latest analyses of economic and capital market developments, as well as our views on trends affecting risk management. Let's get started. Despite monetary tightening, the global financial assets of private households recorded strong growth in 2023. But there is an Atlantic divide and a generation gap as well. We find out more in this episode with Arna Holzhausen, Head of Wealth Insurance and ESG Research, and economist Catherine Stoffel. Hello, Arna and Catherine. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Maria. Hello. So in 2023, global growth slowed down but remained resilient despite high interest rates. How did household wealth fare in this context? Well, um, <clears throat> global financial assets of private households saw impressive growth thanks to thriving stock markets and also higher interest rates. We are talking about a 7.6 increase, completely wiping out the losses of the previous year, when savings fell by 3.5%. By the end of last year, global financial assets reached a whopping 239 trillion euros. But how assets grew really depended on where they were invested. Securities were the big winners, jumping by 11%. And also insurance and pension products recovered quite strongly um, with a solid 6.2 increase. Bank deposits, on the other hand, had a rather weak year, particularly after the boom years triggered by the pandemic. Growth there slowed way down to just um, 4.6%, one of the lowest increases we have seen in the past two decades. And so which countries or regions saw the strongest growth? I think this was also something that made last year special, that we have really seen a recovery, world-based recovery, encompassing all regions. I mean, in fact, it was only two countries that saw slight declines last year. But it's also remarkable that the richest country in our universe, the U.S., even outgrew China. This is something special. Because for sure, China is a much a poorer country normally you would expect. And this was also the case in all the years and decades before that China uh, powers ahead, that the growth in China is much faster, not so last year. I mean, it was by a small margin. It was 8.6 to 8.3%, but still, and this is in a remarkable development. And the reasons for that can be found in the structure of savings in the US because you have a lot of capital market products. You have a lot of shares, a lot of stocks in the portfolio portfolios of U.S. households, this is due to the structural effects of how pension, how retirement funds are organized. You have the individual retirement accounts that play a big role and that secure that even the average household can participate in stock market booms because stocks are an integral part of every portfolio. This is one also of the stories of last year. And so what about debt? Did high interest rates deter households from taking on more debt? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the rise in interest rates had had a significant impact on the demand for credit. Um, Credit growth already um, slowed down in 2022, but it weakened further to 4.1% last year. And this is the lowest increase in nine years. So um, overall, the global debt of private households amounted to almost $57 at the end of last year. It may sound like a lot, but um, the figure is put into perspective when it is considered in relation to global economic output. At around 65%, it is actually slightly below its level of 20 years ago. And that shows that from uh, a global perspective, households do not have a debt problem. So what does all this mean for the global distribution in wealth? Did we see emerging markets making progress to catch up with advanced economies? Yeah, first of all, we have to admit the fact that there is still a very, very unequal distribution of wealth on the global level. I give you just some one figure, and this is the ten percent of the richest uh, people on the world on a global scale on more than eighty five percent of all assets. So 10% on more than 85%. I mean, at least it was an in- improvement over the last two decades because at the beginning of the century, it was still 92%. So slowly but steadily, the world becomes less 
unequal place, but it's still very distorted distribution on the global level. And what is more concerning that we have seen in the first decade of the century, there was an impressive catch-up convergence process. It was also the emergence of a new global wealth middle class. We now have probably 800 to 900 million people in this wealth class. And at the beginning of the century, it was only 400 and mainly coming from, from rich countries already, mainly coming from Europe, from North America or from Japan. Nowadays, if we look at this wealth middle class, we see that most of them come from China, but also from India and from other Asian countries. So this is a progress. This has, but it happened, as I said, mostly in the first half of the century. And the second decade was more characterized by a standstill, by a much slower convergence progress. And this happened, in our view, around 2017, when the trade conflicts break out, especially between US and China. And now we are in a world that is less connected. We have more protectionism. And many people even talk from deglobalization. And we clearly see this is hurting everyone. We have slower growth. We have uh, only lackluster economic activity around the world. But it's especially hard for emerging markets that are deprived of opportunities to grow faster, to catch up, to be connected, to use technology, to leapfrog their economies into the 21st century. And this is then seen in the growth rates, also in financial rates, which are now online with the advanced economy. So it is not that they're really getting poorer, but at least we see that this kind of convergence, this closing of the gap is no longer happening. And this is something that really concerns us. And looking ahead, what's your outlook for global wealth this year? And what are some of the risks to watch out for? This year, I mean, we have already <laughs> nine months are over and the markets are still booming. So this year feels very similar to last year. We have resilient economies, not re no recessions, not growth is not stellar, but at least there is growth. So that means that people have rising incomes, they can save, markets are doing quite well, still uh, defying the interest rate turnaround, still propelled by the euphoria about AI. So for this year, we are quite optimistic in expect a very similar outcome to last year, maybe a tad, tad lower, maybe around 6%, but basically another year of healthy growth. But if we look further ahead, the midterm outlook is not as rosy. And this is for many reasons, because in the end, we already see that this AI or euphoria comes to an end. There's this illusion settling in. And we see also that all these trends, this fragmentating world, that we have this transformation, the higher carbon prices, higher costs, aging, all these are waiting on economic growth leading to slower growth because it's mainly increasing costs. It's not so much a productivity boost in the short term. And this has to be digested also by markets so that by companies so that we expect in the, for the next couple of years more normal returns, not a big correction, no decline or no big slump on markets, but at least that we expect markets to be more in line with long-term historical averages, that means the exceptional years that we have in the past several times where we have double-digit increases. This is very likely a thing of the past and we will not uh, see it again. So that means for, say, to the end of this decade, we expect more around 4 to 5% growth. But again, giving that also the inflation coming down and inflation in hoovers between 2 and 3%, at least we expect also to see real growth for the rest of the decade. And it's not a catastrophe, it's not a gloomy forecast, but it's clearly more of the matter of fact, middle of the road forecast that we expect for savers to be in store for the next years. Thank you very much, Arna and Catherine. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the full report we just spoke about on our website. We'll leave a link in the show notes. If you'd like to discover more of our research, you can also follow the Ludonomics newsletter on LinkedIn. We'll leave a link down below for that too. If you like the podcast, please send it to any of your friends who might like it too, and leave us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. In the meantime, stay tuned for the next episode.